Today is week two of our habit series. Once again, it's taken by Mark Pomery, and if you haven't seen week one, please feel free to go back and check it out. Enjoy. Well, good day to our Elevate Online family uh, from around the world. We've got people joining us from South Korea, from Germany, from Belgium, uh, from the United States, from New Zealand, uh, from the UK, and from right around Australia. So it's great to have you all with us to, uh, as Tom said a moment ago, uh, week two of our new series simply called Habits. Now, if you haven't uh, watched that, you weren't part of our online experience for week one, then you can always go back and watch week one. But let me just catch you up. And for those of you that were with us for week one, let me just uh, give you a bit of a refresher. Uh, we're talking about habits because entering a new year, there's plenty of opportunities for progress, for setting goals that are about things being better, about us being better, about circumstances being better. Uh, but one of the uh, challenges is is to kind of right size the goal and um, to, to not make it so big that it's overwhelming and unattainable and yet at the same time to not enter a new year uh, thinking that all you want to do is just run another lap and preserve the status quo so we're talking about incremental change about things that we can do daily weekly monthly that over a cumulative period of time are actually going to make progress and going to see us moving closer towards achieving our better goals. So uh, one of the, the, the pro tips about setting a better goal or an outcome is maybe instead of thinking about like five years, 10 years, 20 years, which, you know, really, who can predict some of that stuff? Uh, let's maybe just focus on just this year, the next 12 months. What's, a, what's an outcome? What's a goal that you might want to achieve this year? And once you've said that outcome, make sure you understand the process. Make sure you understand what sorts of things, what sorts of habits, what sorts of practices, what sorts of routines you're going to have to consistently implement in order to keep nudging and moving the needle towards achieving that outcome. Then there's this dirty word that we don't all like. It starts with a P, it's called patience. That a lot of the goals that we commit to, a lot of, a lot of what we, uh, the better outcomes that we have uh, put in front of us are gonna take time. And they're gonna take, in some cases, weeks, in some cases, months, and maybe in some cases, it, it won't happen this year, but about the big idea, and here's the key word, eventually, if you commit to the process, you've got the outcome goal in mind and you commit to the process and you keep doing the right things, the right habits, then eventually you'll achieve that outcome. And then the final thing we talked about last week is that who impacts do. That who you see yourself as has a very direct impact on your actions. Do you see yourself as someone who is generous if uh, being a more generous person is one of your goals? Do you see yourself as somebody who is going to become capable of managing finances? Who's gonna become a better spouse? Who's gonna become a more organized person? You might not be there yet, that might not be where you're starting from, but rather than talking yourself down, you need to maybe set some who goals, not just some what goals. Now, I mentioned last week that this is not a series about teaching you to have habits because the reality is we all already have habits. L let, me, let me give you an example. Just picture for a moment for yourself, picture 
a, a typical day. Now, not every day is typical, I understand that, and not every moment in every day is typical, but just, you know, a typical day, maybe like a work day, or if you're a stay-at-home parent, you've got, you know, a kind of domestic CEO day, but, you know, a reasonably typical day. Here's a glimpse into mine. I wake up when my alarm goes off, I turn on my coffee machine, giving that time to warm up. While my coffee machine's warming up, I take my first bathroom break of the day. When I finish my bathroom break, I make myself a coffee. I take that coffee, I then triage my emails in my inbox uh, starting the day. Having triaged my emails, I then go training, a run, a bike ride, something along those lines. When I get back from training, I treat myself, I reward myself with another coffee. I then take a shower, I then have some breakfast, I then start my work day, my first project or my first meeting of the day, and that'll lead me to lunch. And yeah, I know. Doesn't sound very spectacular, so I won't bore you with the rest of the day, but here's the reality. Most of those tasks that I work through in the day require very little thought, very little conscious decision making. I don't consciously decide to turn on the coffee machine. I just kind of zombie my way up and turn it on. I, and and this, is the, this is the big idea that most of, or at least a large percentage of our day is not driven by conscious decisions, but rather it's driven by habits. In, in, in fact, to the point where at some level, we might even operate on autopilot. You know, I, uh, a couple of years ago when we moved out of our last house, uh, the very next day, Louisa, my wife, went to work and drove to work the way that she normally does, around the same time she normally does. And then at the end of her work day, she drove home the same way she normally drives home at around the same time she normally drives home. And she pulled into the driveway of the house that we just moved out of. Now, thankfully, she didn't go and let herself in. Awkward. But she pulled into the driveway and it was only in, in having already pulled into the driveway that she realized, oh my gosh, we don't live here anymore. It was just, a, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just this autopilot kind of habitual practice. Now in 2006, Duke University released a study where they concluded that approximately 40% of what we do in a day is not the result of conscious decisions, but rather is the result of habits. 40% of what we do each day. And so this is why habits matter, because if we've got the right habits in place, then 40% of our day is already taken care of. 40% of our day is already going in the right direction. You're nearly halfway there simply by adopting and developing the right habits. This is why habits are so important. If you want to become the sort of person God's calling you to become, and if you want to achieve the sorts of things he's calling you to achieve, then a solid percentage of what's required has to do with habits versus conscious decisions each and every day. Now, I want to drop us into a slice in history where uh, this idea of a habit being critical, being at the center point of someone's life uh, took place. And so if you've got your Bible app, then uh, join me. I'll, I'll drop it in a moment, but you can grab your second device and open up the Bible app to Daniel chapter 6. And I'm going to read from the message. But Daniel chapter 6, this is a, a book, this is a, a, a historic account of a, a man named Daniel. And he's pretty popular in, in church world, and I'm not going to get there yet. But let me, let me drop you into a time in history where uh, he was a part of a kingdom that wasn't of his God. The king at the time was a, a king named Darius. And Darius and his key political leaders uh, were identifying, like talent IDing, young up-and-coming leaders within the nation. And uh, they'd identified, they'd shortlisted 120 key young leaders and of that 120, in fact, Daniel, they identified as being even head and shoulders above the others in that elite 
group that they talent ID'd. And this is what was written of Daniel in that moment. Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. So here was this young, uh, upcoming leader that was so impressive that the king actually uh, leapfrogged him or was going to leapfrog him and promote him ahead of the people who were already at the second tier of leadership in Darius's kingdom. Well, no surprise to you, I'm sure, to learn that the, those very leaders who were about to get leapfrogged uh, decided that, that, that Daniel was a threat to them, obviously, and they decided that they were going to try and take him down. See, whenever you rise up, whenever you are, 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 are taking next steps, whenever you're going to next levels, you can expect to, get, to find opposition and criticism. And, and that was no exception for Daniel. And so the, the historical account goes on. The vice regents and governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him. But they couldn't dig up anything. He was totally exemplary and trustworthy. Great, great qualities to aspire to. They could find no evidence of negligence or misconduct. So they finally gave up and said, well, we're never going to find anything against this Daniel unless we can cook up something religious. Now, here's a little spoiler. They did go on to cook something up. And what they cooked up was that they um, more or less uh, tricked the king into issuing a decree that nobody in, the in that kingdom was permitted to pray to anybody, any god, any deity, any entity, apart from praying to King Darius. So, before I tell you what happens next, when I read about someone like Daniel as being described as being exemplary, as being trustworthy, as of, of having no skeletons in his closet, that nothing can be thrown against him. Whenever I see uh, and read about an account of somebody who's, who's head and shoulders above the, their peers, uh, which, by the way, this is what autobiographies are typically uh, written about great men and great women in history. It's because you know, they've stood out for, for, for various reasons. And I love reading autobiographies and biographies of great men and women in history. Because it's not... Why stop short of just reading like the headline or reading like the, 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 the end of the, the story when we have the opportunity to actually uh, zoom out go back in history and, and find out what happened to them, kind of reverse engineer what it was that caused that person to be, over time, the person they became, and over time, be, achieve what they came to achieve. And what I'm about to share with you is Daniel's, dare I say, secret weapon, and it was that he had one particular habit that he consistently did each and every day that helped shape him to become the sort of person he became and help him ultimately achieve the sorts of things that he achieved. And so the kings issued this decree and in verse 10, the, the historical account says this, that when Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted, he continued to pray. He continued the habit just as he had always done. His house had windows in the upstairs that opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising God. Now, we firmly believe that prayer changes things, that prayer changes circumstances, that prayer changes people. Absolutely. That's not the focus of the, the message today. I, I don't have time to go there. We'll go there another time. Uh, what I want to instead focus on is that Daniel continued to do the very thing that he'd been doing up to that point that had been very much a, a, a key to him becoming who he was at that moment in history, that he continued to pray three times a day 
every single day, continued, continued, continued. That was, and he understood, the power of habits. Which, by the way, is the title of one of the books that we've used to uh, prepare this message series, a, a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Uh, it's uh, one of the, the, the all-time classics on habits. And I strongly encourage you to uh, jump on that, get that, read that, learn from that, be inspired by that, put the lessons into practice that Charles Duhigg talks about. Uh, one of which is what he calls a keystone habit that he encourages us and he's studied the lives of successful people across spheres uh, throughout history that they would have and he encourages us that we would develop, adopt and develop a keystone habit. This is something that's, that we do not break, that, that we do not deviate from, that we do not uh, ever pull back from that we commit to and execute consistently. And what Charles Duhigg talks about is that, that these keystone habits or, or a keystone habit, not only does it uh, move us towards achieving the outcome that that habit is designed to do. You know, you want to get healthy, so you decide every single day you're going to keep a food journal and there's certain things you're going to eat intentionally and there's certain things you're not going to eat intentionally. Well, that's a keystone habit. You want to get fit, so you decide you're going to go to the gym every day, every day, or a run or a bike ride or whatever form of activity spins your propellers, but you commit to that and you do that every single day. Well, that will have its own reward. You will get fitter. Your cardiovascular system, your musculoskeletal system, of course, will improve. But Charles Duhigg talks about the, the, that, that, that keystone habits actually have a ripple effect that once we commit to and consistently execute a keystone habit, that, that we start altering other behaviors in our life that are complementary, that, that, that overflow into those areas. And so not only does the keystone habit impact the outcome that that habit was intended to achieve, but it actually starts to shape uh, us and the outcomes in our life across multiple aspects of our life. And so, so Dave, I mean, Daniel had this keystone habit of praying three times a day, rain, hail or shine, king decree or no king decree. So as we're entering a brand new year, 2021, what's, here's my question, what's a keystone habit that you have and you're going to carry over into 2021. No exceptions. No, uh, it's a deal breaker. You, you're going to keep going. Or what's a keystone habit that you might implement, that you might adopt, that you might commence in 2021? Make it incremental and make it achievable. Say this year, I'm going to work out six days a week exercise activity six days a week and six days a week you commit to that that is a key stone habit just pick one and that might be it it might be you're going to read your bible every day and you're saying now again that might be it that might be the keystone habit and you would pick the, the 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 habit of reading your bible every day and you're not talking yet about fitness goals and financial goals you're focusing on a keystone habit, nailing that one thing. You know, we talked last week, uh, you know, I used the example um, quite consistently, particularly coming out of the Christmas season. It, it may be that, that you want to eliminate credit card debt. And so your habit is that every pay period you will throw additional monies, you'll find and you'll carve out in your budget additional monies to throw beyond the minimum monthly payment. And that's it. So your keystone habit is paying down credit card debt, not reading your Bible, not fitness goals. That's your keystone habit. But Duhigg talks about the fact that by simply adopting a keystone habit, it will have a ripple effect into other areas of your life, even without you focusing on those other areas of your life at the beginning of the process of adopting and executing your keystone habit. 
So the intent of this series is to really set you up for success, to really give you a leg up, to give you a jump start into 2021. So uh, in that spirit, let me show you something that's reasonably universally taught in the arena of habits. And it's often referred to as the habit loop or the habits loop. And it looks like this. Trigger, routine or action, and reward. That for you and I, that there's something or that we can set up something that will trigger a thought in us, that will trigger a, oh yeah, I need to do that. I should do that. I ought to do that. And that trigger then leads to action or routine or habit, like doing something about that. And the doing something then, on the far side of that, sparks a reward. And we love that reward. We love the dopamine. We love the what, whatever the, the recognition, the, the sense of achievement, whatever it is. And, and, and having achieved that reward, we're hopefully more likely to be searching out that trigger again. Now, I mentioned this last week, and it bears repeating today, this habit loop cuts both ways. This habit loop works for bad habits as much as it works for good habits, that certain things trigger us to do things that are harmful, things that are less than God's best. And we, in most of those cases, will achieve a short-term reward. Uh, but unfortunately, that's often enough to cause us to look for the same trigger or even just get caught up in this same trigger action reward loop. So it works for bad habits. Thankfully, it also works for good habits. So a pro tip is to zoom in on the trigger. If that's, if that's like the first domino, which by the way, this is the reason we use the dominoes. We use the dominoes uh, in the opening video montage to symbolize the keystone habits, that one habit has a ripple effect. And that same visual of the dominoes uh, cascading can also play into this idea of the habits loop. And the first one is the trigger. And so a pro tip for us implementing and executing consistently and building on some momentum on our habits is to make sure the trigger, that we set up a trigger and that we set it up. Don't just kind of wander around hoping it pops out of the woods at us, that we set up a trigger and set it up. When you set it up, make that trigger obvious and easy. Let me give you some examples. Let's say you have the goal or you've set the outcome that you're gonna work out every day and the action or the routine that you want to achieve is you're gonna work out in the morning. That's what I do. You're gonna head out the door and, and do your activity in the morning. So, so you've got your outcome, you've got your big idea. You know what the action required is, but that action needs to be preceded by a trigger. And here's a classic trigger. And again, this is what I use and recommend, is get everything you need for that workout. Get it ready the night before and lay it out the night before. Lay out your, 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 your clothing, your shoes, your water bottle, your push bike, whatever it is, your gym gear, whatever it is, your swimming uh, paraphernalia. Get it and lay it out the night before somewhere that in the morning when you walk from bed to door that you're going to see it. And just that very consistent trigger of seeing your workout gear makes it obvious but it also makes it easy you're not scrambling around oh where's my shoes or where's my water bottle or where's my gym membership card? you've 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 just going to pick everything up and head out the door and do your workout obvious and easy here's another one that i use and recommend <laughs> And I'm not the, the world's most disciplined person. These are just some things that I understand. So I'm sort of teaching from understanding in this case. Uh, you've set the goal this year, let's say, for example, of being a more disciplined person, a more organized person. And 
So the action that you think is going to help you achieve that goal, the action is that you're not going to hit the snooze button. Not once, not twice, not three or four times, that you're going to get up at the predetermined time that you've set because you've got to, you want to be productive that day. You want to be disciplined that day. You want, don't want to be running around, scrambling around, disorganized, catching up, fretting. Here's the, the way, here's a way to set up that trigger. With the permission of the people in your house, <laughs> position your alarm clock, your phone, walking distance, like you need to be able to hear it, but walking distance away from your bed. Because in that case, to state the obvious, you will have to, when that alarm goes off, get up out of bed and move and switch it off and not hit the snooze button. And you'll be less likely to crawl back into bed. Again, it's obvious and it's easy. Here's another one. Maybe this year you've set the goal for yourself to uh, achieve and experience greater intimacy with God. And, and, and one of the actions that you know will play to that goal is to read your Bible every day. Bible app, for example. And so, uh, in fact, you might even make it, uh, it, well, here's an obvious and easy way to do that. On your smart device, if you're gonna read a Bible plan from there, the night before, Close social media apps, close them, and leave the Bible app as the first open app on your phone. You know what I'm talking about. You know how this works. You open your phone in the morning, and the, the, the last app that you used the night before is the first app you're going to see in the morning. Well, why not make that the Bible app? And you've actually closed all of the other social media apps. So here it is. Yes, you can still just brush by that, we know that, but, but, but these are things that you want to do. So why not make it obvious, Bible app, and easy, oh, there it is. We said last week, the big idea for this series is that successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And we, hope and pray that you're going to be one of those successful people because you're committing to do consistently what you need to do to develop and execute the habits that are going to see you move in the direction that God's calling you to. So here's, those are some uh, tips about starting habits, how we can start habits. Next week, I want to talk about some ways to stop and some things that we might, as, might want to stop in 2021. So I would love you to join us next week uh, for our online experience. Bring a friend, as Tom uh, is probably going to tell you, and uh, enjoy that with them and go on the journey with them and you can encourage one another. And we love that you're on the journey with us and hopefully we're an encouragement to you as well. So have a great week. Uh, get those habits going. Keep them going. And we'll check in with you next week.